So part two of our series on the craze, their empire behind bars. In March 1969, gang bosses Ron and Reg Cray started life sentences for murder. Many believed their notorious crime empire had been brought to an end. But the reality was to be very different. They were still wheeling and dealing from inside prison. It had just moved. The only problem was for the craze that they had to get other people in to do those deals. You know, the network, the people behind the craze, even though they were locked away, was, you know, was still ongoing. There were still plenty of people who were out there willing to help them and willing to do you know, things for them. He had his own pong, if you like, his, his own private pong, where if he wanted that pong, no one else would use it until he used it. Now, he would use that pong and he would make probably 20 or 30 calls between six and bang up, which is about half seven. You're supposed to have about seven phone calls a week, but um, it all depends if, I mean, me and to go through 40, 50 a day sometimes, a day. Conducting business over the phone was not the only way Reg issued instructions. After honing his fighting skills in the prison gym, Reg, who was a professional boxer in his youth, regularly summoned people to meetings. He would have seven or eight visitors at one time, where he's only allowed two. But he, he would farm out the others on other people's BOs, visiting orders, but they were all there ostensibly to see Reg, and they would do the rounds. When Reg is done with one visitor, and <clears throat> they go on their way and they call you over, and you get up off of the table and you go and sit down and you have your chat with Reg. And we go around like musical chairs. And sometimes visitors went maybe 200 miles to see Reg and they had maybe three minutes of his time. And if they couldn't come up with what he wanted, they wouldn't get three minutes even, you know. This was, he was very, very, he was chairman of the board, really. It was a business meeting. It wasn't a visit. Reg wasn't in jail. Reg was in his boardroom. He hated Easter. He hated Christmas because he would have to take two or three days off from his business. Then he would ring, should we say, day after Boxing Day, say, thank God I can get back to business. So boring, these holidays, aren't they? It was quite Python-esque, but it happened. And Reg was very much money first, last, and in between. And he didn't care who got it for him, or how they got it, or as long as they got it. He always said, I am the one who makes the rules. I do the business. He was the boss of crime. Reg was issuing contracts on people to stab them, to shoot them, to do something to them, to make sure that they knew that they weren't supposed to do that again. That's the way Reg Cray was. So he was paying people to do things outside of jail. I had muscle for hire in my job. I, I, I had 500 doormen that were fighting two or three times a night on the door of a nightclub. And to go and give someone a good right-hander for 500 quid, they were for hire. And he felt it very easy to then call that upon me. I then didn't want to do it. But like in, any, in anything at all, once you've done something once, it's really hard to not do it again. Anyone want to get, he, he wanted to sort it out whilst I was around for him. I'd get it done. You know, just people use this word contracts, but like, we're not talking about contracts to kill, but you know, anyone needed livening up a little bit, it'd be me to get it, I'd either do it or sort it out for him. When Ron Cray was attacked by Peter Suckliff, the Yorkshire Ripper in Broadmoor, Ron wanted to call it a day. Ron said, look, it's over with, forget it. But Reg could not, he could not forget. Somebody had attacked his twin brother. It was Reg's reputation that was on the line. It wasn't Ron's. It had nothing to do with Ron. So Reg said, right, I'm going to get this guy. He found somebody who was going to be transferred to Broadmoor. He issued a contract on Sutcliffe. And this guy stabbed Sutcliffe in the eye. A court later ruled that the attacker, a friend of Reg's, was mentally disturbed. Reg never stopped intimidating people, in my view. When he got comfortable with me, after a year, he started asking me to intimidate people for his own gain, of which I did. The first thing Reg asked me to do was go around and evict someone that shouldn't have been in a house for another friend of his. 
Reggie told us to go there very early on a Sunday morning, knock on the door, give him the, the worst hiding he had ever had. Which we did, we went there, knocked on the door. As soon as he comes out, like, I smashed him as hard as I could in the face. And I broke my hand. Looked at me hand, my hand's collapsed. And now the guy that's with me, he's, uh, he's got a snap-on ratchet with him. And he put this all about his face. Like, like nobody's business. This guy was totally unconscious. Jumping up and down on his face. Get in the car, like, we bugger off. Get down to prison, we tell Reg, right, it's sorted. He didn't have two words to say. Well done, that was it. Like, now I'm thinking this bloke's dead. His nose was on one side of the floor and his teeth were on the other side of the fence. And he didn't, he didn't even know his own name. And uh, Reg didn't give a monkey to tell the truth. And as far as he was concerned, he was doing a favour for a little boy in a prison that was doing him favours. One of my sons encountered um, Reg Cray in uh, Parkhurst Prison. And my son had not gone in the name of Collins, which is the name that uh, Reg should have known him by. He'd gone in in his surname uh, of my second husband. But that didn't stop Reg going and saying to him, your mother gave evidence against me at the Old Bailey. And somebody ran past him and sliced his face open with a razor. Reg Cray was what I would call a, a manipulator of, of people. Um, he was um, a guy who usually got what he wanted, one way or another. He had a lot of influences in, in, uh, in the prison and on the outside. And, and many times, Reg asked people and myself to follow prison officers and just let him know where they lived, what type of background these prison officers had, whether they had a family, children, so on. And, and then he would use that as intimidation for uh, prison officers when he was on a visit to uh, turn a blind eye to any packages or any money or any, anything that shouldn't have been, ha been happening. Could you please go and see someone and make sure that he doesn't call me a, a dirty, stinking killer? Because it's not true. I'm not a dirty, stinking killer. I may have been a killer, but I wasn't a dirty, stinking type. Could you please go and see him or ask someone Maybe he saw a name at me, uh, to make sure that he doesn't say it again, please. Nicely, of course. And this happened. I was owed uh, uh, money at one point by an agent whose name we won't mention, but I think he knows who he is. Uh, owed me a, quite a considerable amount of money. And for months, for months I'd be able to say, well, you owe me money. He said, oh, Richie, you'll get it when I've got it, blah, blah, blah. And the two days after I'd been to visit Reg, it had been in the papers that uh, I'd been to visit him at Maidstone. And the following day, I got a cheque from this agent. And to this day, I kind of put it down to the fact that he went, Oh, you took the cheque, Reggie, go for it, I'll give the money. <laughs> After four or five years waiting for Reg, I could have had any man taken off the street at a click of my fingers. And I felt more powerful than I ever felt in my life. And it was, it was unbelievable. It was, it, was, it was a feeling of, I felt untouchable. I was touchable. I was very touchable. But you don't see that. To succeed at something like the twins have succeeded at, on the scale that they have succeeded, you can't do it without a hint of violence, a hint of menace. And believe you me, the twins were the original merchants of menace. In 1980, Ron and Reg Cray were separated. Ron's mental stability had deteriorated. He was declared insane and sent to Broadmoor. He was still organising things from inside Broadmoor. And the things that he used to wear and the people that things used to send me in with, I'd go and pick up three pure white silk shirts, beautiful Italian silk shirts, and take them into him. And he had a tailor called Barry Scott, come from Wembley, go into Broadmoor, stand him up, measure him up every six months for a silk Italian style suit. Crocodile shoes, 300 pound a pair. He had access to lots and lots of dough. He had his bank accounts, his building society accounts. He was a little more, surprisingly, a little more shrewd than Reg in that respect. I remember being called out one day to Broadmoor by the canteen man. 
I was with Charlie Cray at the time. We'd had a wonderful visit. He was never in a good mood with Charlie Cray, Ronnie. He'd tell him off and have a go at him at the table. But this particular afternoon, it was good. As we left, the canteen man came out and said, Charlie, can I talk to you for a moment? Say, well, what's the matter? It's about Ronnie's bill. Well, how can you have a bill? You used to drink four non-alcoholic lagers, which was, of course, all you were allowed in there. Barbican, their name was. I'd have maybe two teas or two coffees. Charlie Cray would have two teas and two coffees. Well, his canteen bill is £900. Now, we used to have the visits in a hall. And next to the hall was a shop. Now, I'm talking about a shop. Not a, uh, a little shop, something like Marks and Spencer's. In that shop was clothes, lighters, cigarettes, sweets, chocolate, no drink, no alcohol, nothing like that. Uh, trainers. It, it was a, and a guy who run the shop, funny enough, his name was Reg. Ronnie was always in the shop buying lighters and get them engraved and send them to people. Um, christening mugs, he, you know, if, uh, he heard someone had a baby, he'd go in there and say, Reg, would you uh, send a christening mug and engrave it and put it on my accounts? One day, I'd just come off a visit seeing Ron, and the guy who owned the shop, little Reg, called me and said, Jackie, said, can I ever talk to you? I said, certainly, Reg, what's about? He said, would you like to come in my office, you know? So I went in his office, sat down, he said, um, I'm a bit concerned, Jack. I said, well, what's, what's, what's the matter, Reg? He went, he said, Ronnie's run a bill up at £7,000. I said, well, don't worry. He's going to get half a million pounds shortly for, for, his, for the movie. He'd be paid. He went, oh, all right, Jack. And he, you know, and going out the door, I said, oh, by the way, is he all right for his more credit? He went, don't worry. He can have as much as he wants. He was known in Broadmoor as the watchman. He used to ask his visitors, please, could you bring me in a watch? And he didn't mean a penny ante watch, he meant an expensive watch. And then I'd go with the guy and he'd sit down. Ronnie Cray, this is Joe, but he'd like to meet you, shake hands. The eyes used to light up like a kid in the factory of sweets. Oh, I like that watch. Um, could you get me one like that? To which, you see, any, any guy looking at Ronnie Cray, sitting there, going to be there for 30 years with no um, hope of being free, would go, oh, hell. You can have it. If you wore anything and then he liked it, you had to give him it. That was it. And when you think about it, doing 30 years, keep him happy we used to do it, you know. Because uh, let's face it, he was doing 30 years, we went. So we get, you know, and I had this beautiful coat on. He looked down, he went, ooh, Jack, he said, what a beautiful overcoat. And I knew he wanted it. I went, Ronnie, I'll leave the coat at reception for you, you know. Reg Cray visited his brother every six months. The transport would be laid on. He'd have two or three or maybe four heavy guards going with him for the ride. Wherever Reg was, around the country, Parkhurst or whatever, he would have this six-monthly visit to see his brother, where they could sit down quietly and discuss all their personal business. Released from prison in 1975, elder brother Charlie was fronting the family firm. When Charlie came out of jail, after being inside for seven years, one of his first contacts was with the mob in New York. These people had certain ideas of how Charlie could get back into business. One of them, of course, was setting up a record company. The initial idea of Attack Music Corporation was to launder money. The original two million was to come in, help to set up the company, run it as a legitimate company but the idea was because most of the artists came from America and money would be coming backwards and forwards from America this was an obvious laundering setup and when I found out exactly what was going on I was originally a part of that company I pulled out I got up one day and I said this has gone far enough <laughs> and I walked Attack Music Corporation went out of existence in the late 1980s. I had sawn off shotguns stuck under my nose and told, you be quiet about this or else. I've been threatened, people telling me that they'll pick my children up from school. And when Charlie Cray tells me on the phone he'll take care of me, even if he has to spend the rest of his life in jail, this is serious business. 
Although protecting their money laundering scams was paramount, Reg was constantly looking for new ways of generating cash. Fellow prisoner, Bradley Allardyce, who during his 10 years inside became so close to Reg that Reg referred to Bradley as his adopted son, remembers one very lucrative prison visit. You know, I mean, for instance, two people from Blackpool come down to see me and Reg on a visit and said um, they owned hotels and they just sold up all their hotels and asked Reg if they could open a club in Blackpool called The Craze. And Reg said yes, and they give him £30,000. Six months later, we didn't hear nothing for six months. Six months later, they've got in touch again and said, Reg, we decided against doing that club. Di um, didn't even mention the money. Didn't even ask for the money back. Every week, I would say that Reg come out of a new business idea. Some of them were workers and some of them wasn't, but he'd insist on putting equal amount of effort into each project. He earned a shilling and spent one in six all his life, so did his brother Ron. And I really do think, taking it to extremes, that if Reg had earned ten million pounds in the years he was in prison, he would have spent ten and a half million pounds. Because ostensibly it wasn't his money. He didn't really care. He was enjoying it. Had all he wanted and his friends had all they wanted. It meant um, freedom. No one telling me what to do. I could tell people what to do. It meant um, having money, even though I weren't spending it. It meant um, walking down the street and people saying, works for the twins, that boy. Reg sent a limousine for me. Now, this, this car was meant to have been President Eisenhower's presidential Cadillac of 1956. They come and open the car for me like I'm a king. I'm, I'm at the bar now, and champagne's being thrown at me. Now, nah, what does that tell you? What the mm. name of the Cray can do for you? And you have this huge, huge ego that was being fed incessantly by his army of groupies, camp followers, and admirers. Reggie's biggest financial um, coup was a lottery winner, Carl Crompton. He won 11 million pounds on the lottery. He gave Reggie 100,000 pounds. Reg asked him if he could borrow it to set up a few business deals and this and that, and Carl said, yeah, it would be a pleasure. And um, Reg um, asked Carl if he could make out the cheques for £33,000 each, and Reg got back to the cell and got out a piece of paper from his drawer, sat down and spent that £100,000 in about 15 minutes, writing down a list of people to give it to, debts to pay as well. You know, about a week later, he was up saying, right, come on, we've got to get a few quid. I said, like, Reg had us grand last week. One day I went to see Ronnie on a visit. And I come out with this idea to him. I said, Ronnie, I said, look, I said, we've got the best name in the business. I said, why don't we do a personal bodyguard service for film stars and Arab noblemen? So he said, yeah, because he, he always agreed with me, Ronnie. He said, Jack, he said, what a wonderful idea, because he was an order show business and that type of thing, you know. So I thought of this thing called Crayley Enterprises. And what it was is we look after Arab Norman and Hollywood stars. We went in slightly un underfunded, but we got over that problem. I come up with this idea. We'll advertise in a melody for bodyguards. Now, we didn't want these people. So I, we advertised in a melody to send a two pound registration fee to join Crayley Enterprises as a bodyguard. And, you know, it was unbelievable. Within two weeks, we had over £17,000 in post loaders. A good crew, and we'd done everything right everywhere. We had accountants, we had a banking account, which I won't get down that side of it. And it was, it, it, was, it was lovely. It was a registered business. The police come to see us. They said, yeah, carry your bond by all means. We're looking after the Arabs and the film stars. Best thing since sliced bread. They just couldn't stop making money and spending or giving it away. The growing fascination with the Cray cult also attracted a string of celebrities to visit them in prison. One in the early 80s was former pop star Roger Daltrey. Roger Daltrey wanted to do the film, and in the end of the day he bought the rights, and sat on them for five years and didn't make the film in the end, um, sold them on again. The rights were sold to Parkfield Group PLC. The contract says very, very clearly Charlie Cray was to get 100,000, Reg Cray, 100,000, Ron Cray, 100,000 pounds. Charlie would also get money, quite a substantial sum, as technical advisor. 
Another set of twins, the Kemps, were picked to play Ron and Reg in the movie depicting their life of violence in the East End. You're in trouble, Jack! Before filming started, the Kemps went to visit Ron in Broadmoor. And when they walked in, they'd on purposely worn overcoats, shirts, ties, and slicked back their hair. Even the wardens on the door, they just couldn't believe it. They, they, they said, these are the two guys that are going to play the twins. And I went, yeah. And we sat down and I said, look, I'll just say hello, blah, blah, blah. Then I'll go and sit with Charlie Smith so you can talk some business. And in case Ronnie wanted to tell him little, they wanted to pick up little things that he did, you know, especially the hand movements and the quietness of the voice. Because I think everybody you talk to thinks that because they were feared so much, they shouted and screamed, whatever. Well, if the guy is menacing enough, you never have to raise your voice because Ronnie Craig could just look at you with one look. And what he wanted done was done. And he looked at those two and he just said, who's playing me? And Martin Kemp smiled. And the minute that Martin Kemp smiled, you're the soft one. You can play Reggie. <laughs> and he looked at Kerry Kemp and he went, you're playing me. What'd you say? Me? Oh. Nothing. Yes, you did. You called me something. What'd you call me? During negotiations for the film rights, the craze's biggest underworld rival in the 60s, torture gang boss Charlie Richardson, tried to muscle in on the deal. Richardson sent his associate, Eddie Jones, to see Ron. In 1984, Charles Richardson was released from his 25-year sentence, for which he served 19 years. He said to me in his office one day in, in New Cross, why did you pop down to Broadmoor to see the Mad Hatter? I understand that Roger Daltrey's blanked them and more dough for their film. See if we can walk in on it. To help persuade Ron, Eddie Jones took fellow gang member Mad Frank Fraser and the actor Stephen Burkoff, who was to play George Cornell, on the visit. So one spring morn, Frank Fraser, uh, Stephen Burkoff and myself popped down to Broadmoor. Stephen Burke was absolutely rigid with fear, I think, at this time. First question Ron said to me was, well, why doesn't Charlie come to see me? Charlie Richardson. Well, I said, it's very difficult, Ron, I said, for him to come and see you, isn't it? You know, you shot George Cornell. Frank, you know, who worked for Charlie, he was a good friend of Charlie's. Olive, George Cornell's wife, is still around in Peckham. What's he going to tell her if he bumps into her? Oh, I went down to see Ron last week, Ron Cray. I mean, he can't do it, can he? Let's be honest. To which Ron Cray replied, well, it's nothing personal, you see, in those days. What you've got to realise is, I shot George Kenner, but it wasn't personal. And Frank Fraser gave a classic reply to that. He said, well, in my, in my book, Ron, he said, shooting a man in the head and killing him, he said, and blowing his brains over the bar of a pub is the most personal thing you can ever do to anyone. It's the most personal thing I've ever heard of. The success of the film glamorized the Cray's violent exploits, creating a wave of hero worship amongst a younger generation. In episode three, how the Cray movie created a new money-making era, and they cashed in big time. 